we will now look at income tax table under the head salaries. First, few basic concepts. Employer-employee relationship is necessary for income to be charged to tax under the head salaries. As far as a partner in the firm is concerned, salary, bonus, commission or remuneration from the firm is not taxable under the head salaries but under PGBP. As far as the MP, MLA, MLC is concerned, remuneration received by such person is taxable under the head IFOS and, and not under the head salaries. However, daily allowance and constituency allowance are exempt under section 1017, which we have noted in the topic on exempt incomes. What is the basis of charge of income under the head salaries? Salary is chargeable either on due basis or as advance or as arrears. Due basis. Salary which is due in the previous year, whether it is paid or not in that previous year is taxable in that previous year. Then advance. Salary which is paid or allowed in the previous year, though it is not due in that previous year or before it became due, is taxable in the previous year in which it is paid or allowed. This refers to salary in advance. Lastly, arrears. The arrears of salary which is paid or allowed in the previous year is taxable under the head salaries in that previous year if not charged to tax for any earlier previous year. If it was already charged on due basis, then it will not be charged again on its receipt. Now let's look at the master chart for computing income under this head. First, we aggregate taxable salary payments, taxable allowances and taxable perquisites which gives us the amount of gross salary income. From this, we allow deductions on account of section 16. First is a standard deduction, second entertainment allowance and third professional tax. And finally, we arrive at the income taxable under the head salaries. Uh, as far as taxable perquisites are concerned, what we need to note that uh, Perquisites are taxable not only when provided to the employee, but certain perquisites are taxable even when provided to any member of the household of the employee. And member of the household includes what? It includes the spouse of the employee, the children and their spouses, parents, servants and dependents. We will now look at certain general payments. Certain general payments are fully taxable. Basic salary or wages, Commission, whether it is based on turnover or otherwise, fees, then overtime salary, salary in lieu of notice period, bonus, all these are fully taxable. Commission, which is based on a fixed percentage of turnover is considered as part of salary for computing retirement benefits. And we will look at this when we will refer to the retirement benefits. And this is denoted as C within brackets TO in this document. As far as DNS and compensatory payments are concerned, certain allowances are fully taxable. These are DNS allowance, city compensatory allowance, project overtime interim allowance, all of these are fully taxable. If the terms of employment provide that DNS allowance or DA is to be considered as part of salary for computing retirement benefits, then we need to make calculations accordingly. And this is something that we will look at while referring to the retirement benefits and this is denoted by DA within bracket T in this document. Certain special allowances which are in the nature of DNS and compensatory. One, so underground allowance, employee covered, an employee working in uncongenial, unnatural climate and underground mines, place at which allowance is exempt, the whole of India and exemption is 800 per month while the balance is taxable. Second, special compensatory allowance like tribal area allowance, schedule area or agency area allowance. All employees are covered and the place at which allowance is exempt, there is a list of specified states. In such case, exemption is 200 per month and the balance is taxable. We now look at the taxability in respect of retirement benefits. As far as annuity is concerned, it is fully taxable. Gratuity. Gratuity which is received while in service is fully taxable. But gratuity which is received on death, retirement, etc. It is exempt. If it is received by an employee of central government, state government or local authority, it is fully, fully exempt. If it is received by any other employee, then the exemption, the quantum of exemption depends on whether the employee is covered under uh, Payment of Gratuity Act or not covered under Payment of Gratuity Act where the employee is covered under 
पोगा और पेमेंट ऑफ ग्रेचुटी एक्ट एग्जामेशन इज इक्वल टू लोअर ऑफ ए बी सी ए अमाउंट एक्चुअली रिसीव एज ग्रेचुटी बी रुपीज ट्वेंटी लैक विच देन बिकम्स द मैगजिम अमाउंट ऑफ एग्जामेशन पॉसिबल एंड सी इज फिफ्टीन डेज सैलरी फॉर ईच ईयर ऑफ सर्विस वॉट इज फिफ्टीन डेज सैलरी फॉर ईच ईयर ऑफ सर्विस इट इज फिफ्टीन डे सैलरी मल्टीप्लाइड बाय द ईयर्स ऑफ सर्विस वॉट इज फिफ्टीन डे सैलरी फिफ्टीन डे सैलरी इज इक्वल टू सैलरी मल्टीप्लाइड बाय फिफ्टीन डिवाइडेड बाई ट्वेंटी सिक्स वॉट इज सैलरी सैलरी मीन्स बेसिक सैलरी प्लस डी एन एस अलाउंस विच इज लास्ट ड्रॉन एज फार एज ईयर्स ऑफ सर्विस इज कंसर्न वॉट इज दिस इट इज रिटायरमेंट डेट माइनस जॉइनिंग डेट and we need to note that period which is more than 6 months is rounded off as 1 year and accordingly we then compute exemption which is lower of a b or c for employee which is not covered under poga exemption is the lower of a amount actually received as gratuity b rupees 20 lakh this a b is the same as that for covered under poga but c is different c is half month salary for each year of service half month salary for each year of service is what it is half month salary multiplied by years of service so what is half month salary for computing half month salary we determine it as equal to average salary for 10 months preceding the month of event we find out the average salary for 10 months preceding the month of event and then we divide it by 2 that gives us half month salary what is salary for this purpose it is basic salary plus dns allowance but only when it forms part of salary for computing retirement benefits dat and commission only when it is based on fixed percentage of turnover cto as far as years of service is concerned we figure out retirement date minus joining date but only completed years are taken into account so this is how we compute the exemption on account of gratuity where the gratuity is received from multiple employees in the same previous year we need to ensure that the total exemption should not exceed the maximum exemption limit of 20 lakh similarly where gratuity has been received in an earlier previous years and therefore exemption was claimed then we need to ensure that this limit of 20 lakh is the cap this is the maximum exemption possible for an employee so therefore the limit of 20 lakh is reduced by the exemption claimed earlier pension so uncommuted pension that is periodical pension is fully taxable but commuted pension that is lump sum pension is exempt to the extent provided in the case of employee of a central government state government local authority or statutory comp or statutory corporation it is fully exempt it is fully exempt but for other employee exemption depends on whether the employee receives any gratuity or doesn't receive any gratuity where the employee receives any gratuity then the exemption is what it is commuted value of 1/3 of pension which he is normally entitled to receive in other words this is the formula in simple terms so we need to do 1/3 multiplied by commuted pension received divided by commutation percentage into 100 where the employee does not receive any gratuity the formula remain similar but one third gets changed to half so exemption is equal to commuted value of half of pension which he is normally entitled to receive and in simple term this is the formula half into commuted pension received divided by commutation percentage into 100 leave salary or leave entitlement the amount received during employment is fully taxable but that which is received on retirement is exempt to the extent provided in the case of employee of a central government or state government it is fully exempt but in the case of any other employee exemption is lower of a b c or d a is leave salary received b is the maximum exemption the cap of 3 lakh c is 10 months into average salary and d is leave credit in months into average salary so the question is what is the meaning of average salary average salary is equal to average salary of 10 months immediately preceding the date not the month preceding the date of retirement so we pick up the duration of 10 months preceding the date of retirement and we figure out the average salary salary means what salary means basic plus dns allowance if 
the terms of employment so provide that means where it is considered part of salary for computing retirement benefits and commission if it is based on fixed percentage of turnover for d what is also relevant is the leave credit which we compute in months now leave credit is what how do we compute this we first determine the leave entitlement in number of days for the period the employee had rented the, the service the, the entire leave entitlement however this cannot exceed so there is a cap it cannot exceed 30 days for each completed years of service so from leave entitlement we deduct certain leaves leaves which have been availed or which have lapsed or which have been encashed while in service so what is left what is left is what can be encashed on retirement so that is called leave credit we divide it by 30 days so this gives us leave credit in months and accordingly we determine the amounts in a b c or d and exemption is lower of a b c or d where leave salary is received from multiple employers in the same previous year then we need to ensure that the total exemption should not exceed the cap of 3 lakh similarly where leave salary is received in earlier previous year and exemption was claimed in respect of that then we need to ensure that the limit of 3 lakh is not breached it, uh, the exemption is limited to this cap so therefore what we do is limit of 3 lakh in the current previous year for exemption computation is reduced by exemption which was claimed earlier we will now look at the tax treatment of provident fund now the provident fund can be either a statutory provident fund or SPF, recognized provident fund or RPF, unrecognized provident fund or UPF or public provident fund or PPF. And the tax treatment, we will look at A, during employment, B, for lump sum payment of accumulated balance on retirement, resignation or termination. So as far as SPF is concerned, employer's contribution is exempt and interest credited on employer's contribution is also exempt as far as employee's contribution is concerned he can claim deduction under section 80c as far as interest on employee's contribution is concerned it is exempt but in case of excess contribution in case of excess contribution it is not exempt we will look at this what about lump sum payment of accumulated balance it is exempt what about RPF? <clears throat> Employer's contribution. It is exempt up to 12% of salary. Beyond this, it is taxable. It is exempt up to 12% of salary. And what is the meaning of salary? Salary is basic plus DNS allowance if it is part of salary for computing retirement benefits and commission if it is based on fixed percentage of turnover. Further, if the employer makes a combined contribution to three funds, which is RPF, approved superannuation fund ASF or national pension scheme NPS and that combined contribution is greater than 7.5 lakh then that excess is also taxable that excess is also taxable what about interest credited on employees contribution it is exempt up to 9.5 percent further the interest which relates to this excess the interest which relates to this excess of 7.5 lakh is also taxable now coming to employee's contribution. Employee's contribution, he can claim reduction under section 80C. What about interest on his contribution? It is exempt up to 9.5%. But in relation to the interest uh, on the excess contribution, so the interest which is in relation to an excess contribution, which we will look in some time, that is not exempt, that is taxable. As far as lump sum payment of accumulated balance on retirement resignation termination is concerned, it is exempt but only if certain conditions are satisfied. If those conditions are, some, are not satisfied, the amount is not exempt. And what are those conditions for exemption of accumulated balance of RPF? If the employee rendered continuous service with the employer for at least 5 years, 5 years or more, then the accumulated balance is exempt. If this is not the case, then we need to check whether the service was terminated due to ill health or contraction or discontinuance of employee's business or other cause which is beyond the control of the employee. If that is the case, then the amount is exempt. If this is still not the case, then we need to see whether the employee has transferred the balance in the fund to the RPF account with his new employer. <coughs> In that case, the amount is 
exempt. If even this is not the case, then we need to check whether the entire balance was transferred to the NPS account of the employee referred in Section 80 CCD. If yes, then it is exempt. If none of these conditions A, B, U, C and D are fulfilled, then the amount is taxable and the amount is taxable as if the fund was a unrecognized provident fund from the beginning. Now in case C where the employee transfers the balance to his RPF account with a new employer, later on when uh, the accumulated balance is withdrawn and when we need to check for the condition of these five years continuous service for determining whether exemption is available or not, the service period under previous employer and the new employer will be aggregated to check the five year condition. So this was about RPF. Now we come to unrecognized provident fund or UPF. So employees contribution ATC deduction cannot be claimed, it is not available. As far as employer's contribution is concerned, interest on employees contribution is concerned and interest on employees contribution is concerned, it is not taxable during the employment, it is exempt. But all this becomes taxable when the lump sum payment is received of accumulated balance. In such case, employee's contribution is anyways exempt because it is employee's own contribution. So there is no benefit to the employee as such. So there is nothing which can be made taxable. But interest on employee's contribution is taxable, but not under the head salaries, under the head IFOS. What about employer's contribution and interest they are on? The whole of it is taxable as salary. What about PPF or public provident fund? So this has got nothing to do with the head salaries, but for a completeness point of view, we will discuss this here. Employer's contribution and interest on employer's contribution is not relevant because employer does not contribute to the PPF. Employee's contribution, he can claim deduction under Section 80C and interest on his contribution is exempt. Further, lump sum payment of accumulated balance on PPF is also exempt. Now in this table, we noted that in the case of SPF or RPF, as far as interest credited on employee's contribution is concerned, the interest which is in relation to excess contribution in both SPF and RPF is not exempt, it is taxable. So we now look at this provision. Interest accrued during the previous year which relates to the excess employee's contribution, we are not talking of employer's contribution, to SPF and RPF is not exempt, it is taxable. So interest accrued during the previous year relating to employee's contribution which exceeds the following limit is not exempt, right? And we need to bifurcate the employee's contribution as contribution made till previous year 2021 and contribution made from the previous year 21-22. As far as contribution till previous year 2021 is concerned, there is no limit applicable. So therefore, irrespective of the amount of employee's contribution, uh, the interest on employee's contribution is not taxable, it remains exempt. But there is a limit which sets in as far as contribution from previous year 21-22 is concerned. And if it is a situation where both employee and employer are contributing to the fund, then the limit is 2.5 lakh per year. If only the employee is contributing, employer is not contributing, then the limit is double to 5 lakh per year. So where for instance both are contributing and in from previous year 21, 22 and onwards, whatever is the amount which the employee contributes, which is in excess of 2.5 lakh per year, we determine the interest on that excess and that amount of interest is not uh, exempt. It is taxable. The other portion of the interest remains exempt. Approved superannuation fund. Tax treatment during employment. Employer's contribution as we noted above in the case of RPF. Combined contribution of the employer to the three funds RPF, AF, ASF and NPS which is greater than 7.5 lakh in the year that excess uh, beyond 7.5 lakh is taxable and the interest in relation to that excess is also taxable. Employee's contribution he can claim reduction under section 80C. 
and interest on employees contribution is exempt. What about payment from the fund? It is exempt if payment is made in certain cases like on death etc. NPS. As far as NPS is concerned, employer's contribution and employee's contribution. What about employer's contribution? Both can contribute. Employer's contribution, it is first included under the head salaries. You need to first include it under the head salaries and thereafter you need to provide deduction under section 80 CCD from the gross total income. Further, as we noted above, combined contribution of employer to the three funds which is greater than 7.5 lakh is taxable. Employee's contribution, he can claim the deduction under section 80 CCD from the gross total income. So as we have noted above, for both RPF and ASF and NPS that there is a combined upper limit for employer's contribution of 7.5 lakh. So employer's contribution to these three funds, the combined contribution, which is in excess of rupees 7.5 lakh in a previous year is taxable as perquisite. And accretion, which is relating to such excess is also taxable as perquisite. Accretion, interest or dividend, etc. So both excess contribution and interest relating thereto is taxable. And there is a formula which has been prescribed for computation of taxable accretion. And there are three steps. In step one and two, we need to determine certain amounts. In step one, we need to determine the amounts for the period from the previous year 2021 to the previous year preceding the current previous year. If we are talking of previous year 22-23, then from previous year 2021 to 21-22 is the period under step 1 and in step 2 we need to compute certain amounts for the current previous year. In step 1 there are two amounts which we need to figure out. Number 1, we need to determine the taxable employer's contribution to the fund or the scheme. What is the taxable amount which is greater than 7.5 lakh, the combined contribution. This we determine for each previous year and then we aggregate and this is what we call as PC1. Next, we figure out the accretion relating to that excess which is taxable as we noted above for each previous year as computed under this particular method and then we aggregate all of that and that gives us what we call as TP1. So this is the step 1. In step 2, we consider the current previous year. First, we figure out the taxable employer's contribution, which is the combined contribution greater than 7.5 lakh, which is taxable. This is what we call PC. Income accrued in the fund or the scheme in the current previous year is I. Average balance in the fund or the scheme, that is balance on 1st April plus balance on 31st March, that's opening plus closing divided by 2. This is what we call FAVG. And then accordingly, we determine the rate of return in the current previous year, and which we call R. And R is what? I divided by FAVG. And then finally, in step 3, we move to compute the amount of taxable accretion for the previous year. And this is a certain amount multiplied by the rate of return, which is R, which we computed above. And what is that amount? It is PC divided by 2. So PC divided by 2 plus PC1 plus TP1, PC1 plus TP1. So PC divided by 2, first part, PC1 plus TP1, second part, we add both these parts and then the amount we multiplied by R and that is what gives us the amount of taxable accretion and this is taxable in the current previous year. So both the excess which is greater than 7.5 lakh, the employee's combined contribution to the three funds and the taxable accretion which is computed as per this formula, both become taxable in the current previous year. So this was about provident fund. VRS compensation. VRS compensation, voluntary retirement compensation received by an employee. It is exempt to the extent of lower of A, B, C, D. A is amount received, B is the upper cap of 5 lakh, C is 3 months salary multiplied by completed years of service, not part year. And D is salary at the time of retirement multiplied by months of service which is left which is left. And what is salary for this purpose? It is basic plus DA 
if it forms part of salary for computing retirement benefits and commission if it is based on fixed percentage of turnover. We need to note that this exemption of VRS compensation is available only one time during the life of an SSE. He cannot claim it more than once. So this was about retirement benefits. We now move to the theme of health and life. As far as fixed medical allowance is concerned, it is fully taxable. What about medical facility provided by the employer? It depends on whether it is provided in India, <clears throat> whether the medical treatment is in India or whether it is outside India. If the medical treatment is in India, then it is exempt. Then no taxable perquisite arises in the four situations. Number one, where the medical treatment is in the employer's own hospital. That means in any hospital maintained by the employer. Second, where the employer reimburses expenditure on medical treatment which has been done A. In a hospital maintained by the government or by the local authority that means in a government hospital or B. In any other hospital but which is approved by the government for medical treatment of its employees. 3. Where there is reimbursement of expenditure by the employer which has been incurred on medical treatment of what? Of prescribed diseases in any hospital but which is approved by the tax authority that is also exempt and lastly where the employee has reimbursed expenditure which has been incurred on medical treatment of what in respect of any illness but which is relating to COVID-19 that is also not a taxable perquisite but there is a condition that the employee should submit the prescribed documents to the employer and these documents include Medical documents for illness suffered within six months. So there is a time limit within six months from the date of being determined as COVID-19 positive. In case of medical treatment outside India, the expenditure incurred by the employer needs to be bifurcated into expenditure on medical treatment, two stay abroad and three travel abroad. As far as medical treatment and stay abroad is concerned, the expenditure there is a limit, there is a cap. So it is exempt only to the extent permitted by the RBI. Beyond this limit, it is taxable. As far as expenditure on travel abroad is concerned, it is exempt only if one condition is satisfied. Otherwise, it is not exempt. What is that condition? That the gross total income of the employee, not the total income, the gross total income should be up to rupees 2 lakh should be up to rupees 2 lakh and this gross total income is computed how it is computed before including such travel expenditure what about health insurance premium paid by the employer for the employee it is exempt now these benefits are not only covered for the employee but also for member of his family and family means what a spouse of the employee children of the employee whether they are dependent on the employee or not it doesn't matter it also includes parents, brothers and sisters but only when they are wholly or mainly dependent on the employee. Hospital includes dispensary, clinic or a nursing home. What about the expenditure for the attendant which is accompanying the employee for treatment outside India? In such case, expenditure on stay and travel of only one attendant, not more than one. One attendance is also covered by the exemption. What about personal accident policy when the employer takes the policy on the life of employees and pays premium, it is exempt. We need to note that the sum which is received for COVID-19 expenditure from the employer is exempt uh, and is covered under the head salaries. But when it is received from a non-employer, it is not covered under the head salaries. Rather, it is covered under the head income from other sources and its tax treatment is governed under Section 56.2x, which we will look at in this topic life insurance life insurance premium paid by the employer is taxable it is not exempt employer's contribution to group insurance scheme is not taxable it is exempt we will now look at housing first house rent allowance or hra where hra is granted to the sse by the employer to meet expenditure on rent in respect of residential accommodation occupied by the sse so the HRA is granted by whom? By the employer. To whom? To the employee. For what? For meeting rental expenditure. In respect of what? The accommodation should be residential and it should be occupied by the SSE. In such case, exemption is allowed, which is lower of 
ए बी और सी ए इज एक्चुअल एच आर ए रिसीव्ड बी इज रेंट पेड माइनस टेन परसेंट ऑफ सैलरी एंड सी इज फोर्टी परसेंट ऑफ सैलरी फोर्टी परसेंट इज इंक्रीज टू फिफ्टी परसेंट इन द केस ऑफ मुंबई कोलकाता डेली एंड चेन्नई वॉट इज सैलरी सैलरी इज बेसिक सैलरी प्लस डी एन एस अलाउंस इफ टर्म्स ऑफ एम्प्लॉयमेंट सो प्रोवाइड दैट मीन्स वेयर इट इज फॉर्मिंग पार्ट ऑफ सैलरी फॉर कंप्यूटिंग रिटायरमेंट बेनिफिट्स एंड कमीशन इफ इट इज बेस्ड ऑन फिक्स परसेंटेज ऑफ टर्न ओवर नाउ देर आर सर्टन नेगेटिव कंडीशंस दैट मीन्स एग्जामेशन इज नॉट अवेलेबल वेयर वेयर आइदर ऑफ दिस इज सेटिस्फाइड वेयर द रेसिडेंशियल अकोमोडेशन विच इज ऑक्यूपाइड बाय द एस एस सी इज एक्चुअली ओन्ड बाय द एस एस सी देन एच आर एग्जामेशन इज नॉट अवेलेबल और वेयर द एस एस सी हैज नॉट एक्चुअली इनकर्ड एक्सपेंडिचर ऑन पेमेंट ऑफ रेंट देन ऑल्सो एच आर एग्जामेशन इज नॉट अवेलेबल रेसिडेंशियल अकोमोडेशन वॉट इज द टैक्सीबल वैल्यू इन रेस्पेक्ट ऑफ रेंट फ्री रेसिडेंशियल अकोमोडेशन प्रोवाइडेड बाय द एम्प्लॉयर देर आर थ्री सिचुएशन फर्स्ट where it is provided by the government employer that means where the employer is the government whether central or state the value the taxable value of the perquisite is the license fee where the residential accommodation is provided by any other employer then it depends on whether the accommodation is owned by the employer or it is hired by the employer where the accommodation is owned by the employer the value is a specified percentage of salary what is the specified percentage it depends on the population of the city for population up to 10 lakh it is 7.5% of salary population greater than 10 lakh and up to 25 lakh 10% of salary greater than 25 lakh 15% of salary where the accommodation is taken on lease or rent by the employer then the value is what it is lower of lease rental or 15% of salary okay now the accommodation may be furnished if the accommodation is furnished we further add the following amount if the furniture is owned by the employer the amount that we add is 10% per annum of the cost of furniture if the furniture is hired by the employer what we add higher charges third this was second now third where the residential accommodation is provided by the employer in a hotel then the value is what it is lower of actual charges paid by the employee to the hotel or 24% of salary now this was the value we compute for rent free residential accommodation what if the accommodation is provided at a concessional rate in that case to the value that we have computed as per the above chart we provide the deduction of rent actually paid by the employee and this gives us the amount of value of residential accommodation provided at concessional rate now in the formula salary is an important parameter so the question is what is the meaning of salary for this purpose so salary is computed for the period the accommodation is occupied by the employee so any other period is not considered and certain items are to be included in the salary and certain items are to be excluded from salary what is included basic salary bonus taxable allowances commission whether it is fixed commission or commission based on percentage of turnover it doesn't matter da is included only when it forms part of salary for computing retirement benefits and finally any monetary payment not a perquisite why because perquisite is excluded from the meaning of salary <clears throat> so perquisite is excluded employees contribution to provident fund is also excluded and lump sum payments received on retirement like gratuity etc are also excluded so for inclusions in the salary this is the mnemonic for learning which you can use if you want bbacdm bbacdm and finally exclusions p p and r so this is the mnemonic which you can use for your learning gas electricity water where the benefit is provided to the employee by way of supply of gas or electricity or water for his household consumption then if the supply is by an agency the value is the amount paid by the employer to the agency that's the taxable value of perquisite if it is supplied by the employer from his own resources that means by the employer himself then the value is the manufacturing cost per unit and if the amount has been paid by the employee that is reduced the balance is the taxable value domestic servants may be provided 
sweeper, gardener, watchman, personal attendant, not only provided to the employee but also to any member of his household. That is covered. And what is the taxable value? Salary which is paid or payable by the employer for such services and of course we reduce any amount which is paid by the employee. If it is a case of servant allowance, it is fully taxable. We now look at travel and conveyance. First, we look at certain special allowances. Category A allowance and Category B allowance. Category A special allowances of three types and all categories of employees are, are covered here. First is traveling allowance for tour or transfer and the second is daily allowance for tour or transfer. So both A1 and A2 cover a case of tour or transfer. What is the expense for which allowance is granted? Cost of travel on tour or on transfer and this includes expenses on transfer, packing etc. Or ordinary daily charges which are incurred by the employee due to absence from his normal place of duty. Same either on tour or for the period of journey in connection with transfer. And third is the conveyance allowance. And this covers expenditure on conveyance and the performance of official duties. For example, between uh, the office and the client location. So official duties. And what is the amount of exemption? To the extent expenses are actually incurred for purpose for which the allowance is granted. And the balance is taxable. Category B allowances. There are two special allowances. <clears throat> First is the disabled conveyance allowance granted to a blind or deaf or dumb or orthopedically handicapped person for meeting expenditure on what for commuting between residence and place of duty but it should be in india not outside india and it is exempt 3200 per month and the excess is taxable second transport system allowance to an employee working in any transport system but in india not outside india for what for personal expenditure during duty of running such transport but the condition is that the person should not be in receipt of daily allowance in such case the exemption is to the extent of 70 percent of allowance but with a limit or a cap of maximum of 10,000 per month now what we need to note is as far as expenditure for commuting between residence and place of work is concerned it is the exemption is not available for everyone it is only available in the case of B1 that is for a disabled person but not for others. Conveyance allowance is exempt under A3 for all the employees but it is not for commuting between residences and place of work it is for conveyance of the performance of official duties alone. Leave travel concession or LTC. Exemption is available for LTC which is received by an employee from whom? From the employer for what? For proceeding to any place in India. So travel outside India is not covered and this can be either on leave or even after retirement or termination of service. Now who should travel? The travel should be for employee and his family. So the family alone without the employee exemption is not available. Either it can be only employee or employee plus his family. What is the meaning of family? The spouse whether dependent or not on the employee is not relevant. As far as children are concerned there is a limit. For children born after 1st October 1998, the exemption is limited to maximum of two children. And when we compute this number, if there is a case of twins which is born after the first child, the twins are considered as one child. So one child which is the first child plus two children which are twins, even though they are three but they are considered as two and therefore exemption is available. Parents, brothers and sisters are covered but only when they are wholly or mainly dependent on the employee. Now there is this concept of block as per which exemption is available only for up to two journeys in a block of four calendar years. Beyond two journeys exemption is not available. And the block is for four years and the current block is running from 2022 to 2025 and this is the calendar year. There is this benefit of carryover also which is provided. If the leave travel concession is not availed by an employee during a particular block, then that can be carried forward to the next block. So that uh, benefit can be claimed in the first year of the next block, but only for one journey, only for one journey. So this is the carryover benefit which is available. Now what is the quantum of exemption for LTC? The quantum of exemption is the lower of 
A, the amount which is spent on travel or B, the following amount. And what is that amount? That is the cap. If the journey is performed by air, then the limit is economy class fare of Air India for the shortest route. Okay. If the journey is performed by any other mode, say by rail or by bus, etc., then there are two situations. If the origin and destination are connected by rail, then the cap is AC first class rail fare for the shortest route. But if the origin and destination are not connected by rail, then it depends on whether a recognized public transport system exists or not. Where it exists, then the cap is first class or deluxe class fare on such transport by the shortest route. And where such recognized public transport system does not exist, then we need to consider the rail fare. And that is the AC first class rail fare for the distance of the journey by the shortest route. And we deem as if the journey had been performed by rail. The point we need to note is LTC exemption covers only the cost of travel. So other expenses like accommodation, food, etc. are not covered by this exemption. Now, what is the taxable value in respect of motor car provided to the employee? Now, there are certain situations. Situation A, where the use of motor car is by the employee wholly for official use, wholly official use, then the perquisite is exempt. But if the specified documentation conditions are fulfilled, and what are those conditions? There are two conditions. The employer has maintained details of official trips and he gives a certificate to the employee to the effect that the expenditure was incurred wholly for official purpose. If this is satisfied, then the perquisite is exempt. Situation B, where the use of motor car is wholly for personal use, wholly personal use. And it can be not only by the employee, but also by any member of his household. So in effect, we uh, take the expenditure incurred by the employer. So where the motor car is owned by the employer, we add 10% per annum of the actual cost of motor car. If the motor car is hired by the employer, we add the higher charges. If running and maintenance expenses are incurred by the employer, we add them. If shopper's remuneration is paid by the employer, we add that. And if any amount has been charged from the employee, we reduce that. And the balance is the taxable value of perquisite. Situation C, where the use is a mixed use. That is partly official and partly personal. And the use may not only be by the employee, but also by any member of his household. Now, in this case, it depends on who owns the motor car, employer or the employee, and who bears the running and maintenance expenses. Where the employer owns the motor car, and this also includes a case where the employer has taken the motor car on hire. So where the employer owns or has hired the motor car and the RNM expenses are borne by the employer. In that case, the taxable value is at the rate of 1,800 per month or 2,400 per month, depending on whether the CC of engine is up to 1.6 liter or more than 1.6 liters. If chauffeur is also provided to run the motor car, then a further 900 per month is added. But if the RNM expenses are borne by the employee, in that case, the value is a slightly reduced value. So this 1,800 becomes 600, 2,400 becomes 900. The rate for chauffeur remains the same at 900. In the second scenario, the motor car is owned by the employee. And then if the RNM expenses are borne by the employer, then how do we determine the taxable value? We first figure out the actual amount of expenditure incurred by the employer. Actual amount. And then we reduce a certain amount. What we reduce is actually the amount attributable to the official use. And what is that amount? At the rate of 1,800 per month or 2,400 per month, depending on the CC whether it is up to 1.6 liters or more than 1.6 liters and a further 900 per month if chauffeur is also provided to run the motor car. 
Now, if the employee claims that a higher amount of official expenses have been incurred than a higher amount, then this 1,800, 2,400 or 900 <coughs> per month can be claimed as a deduction if documentation conditions that we saw some time back are fulfilled. What if the employee owns the motor car and also bears the expenses? In that case, there is actually no perquisite because there is no benefit which is, uh, which is arising to the employee. Next situation is for any other automotive conveyance, for example, a motorcycle, which is owned by the employee and where the expenses, RNM expenses are borne by the employer. In that case, two situations can arise where the use is wholly official use, like motor car, the value is exempt if documentation conditions are fulfilled. Where there is a mixed use, then we first take the actual amount of expenditure by the employer and then we deduct 900 per month attributable towards official use. And this amount can be raised. So a higher amount can be claimed as a deduction if documentation conditions are fulfilled. The point that we need to note is that if there is a use of vehicle which has been provided to the employee by the employer. For what purpose? For journey between the residence and place of work. If there is use of vehicle, that benefit is provided by the employer to employee. For using it between residence and place of work, it is not taxable, it is exempt. Now we come to transport facility by a transporter. <clears throat> In certain cases, the employer himself may be engaged in the carriage of passengers or goods. That means employer may be the transporter and the benefit may be provided to the employee. In what sense? Personal or private journey can be provided by such transporter employer, not only to the employee, but also any member of the household of the employee. Then what is the valuation? Where the employer is an airline or the railways, the value is exempt, it is not taxable. But in the case of any other employer, for example, running uh, buses, then what is the value? The value is the value at which this benefit or amenity is offered by the employer to the public and we reduce any amount which is recovered from the employee and the balance becomes the taxable value. We now look at the area of education. First, certain special allowances. Research allowance is exempt to the extent expenses are actually incurred for purpose for which allowance is granted and the balance is taxable. Children education allowance which is for children education in India not outside India. What is the amount of exemption at the rate of 100 per month per child but up to a maximum of two children. Children hostel allowance this is for what hostel expenditure on the child in India not outside India. The exemption is what? 300 per month per child up to a maximum of two children. What about educational facility provided to the employee? Now where the educational facility is provided or training is provided to the employee, it is exempt. But where the educational facility is provided to any member of the household of the employee, it is taxable. And there are three situations. In situation A, the educational institution is employer's own educational institution. So educational institution is itself maintained and owned by the employer. In that case, what is the value? The value is the cost of education in a similar institution where in or near the locality. And there is a threshold exemption of 1000 per month. So the perquisite is exempt if the benefit per child per child is up to 1000 per month. Else it is taxable. In situation B, though the educational institution is not the employer's own, but the employer has a tie-up. And because of that reason, uh, the educational facility is provided to the member of household. In that case also, the valuation is similar to that of A and the similar exemption threshold of 1000 per month is available. For any other case, the value is the expenditure incurred by the employer in this respect. In any case, for each of these ABC, we reduce the amount which is paid or recovered from the employee and the balance becomes the taxable value. Now, as far as the threshold of 1000 per month is concerned, there are two views. One is that if the value exceeds 1000 per month, then the entire value is taxable. View two, if the value exceeds 1000 per month, only the excess over 1000 per month is taxable. 
mostly view one is followed but if you follow view two then it will be better if you give a note to clarify this in your answer what about assets which are provided to the employee and it can be either use of movable asset or transfer of movable asset use of movable asset where there is use by the employee of any movable asset and not only the use by employee but also use by any member of household of the employee then in case of laptops and computers the value is exempt it is not taxable but in respect of all other assets it depends on two situations where the movable asset belongs to the employer then the taxable value is 10% per annum of the actual cost to the employer where the asset is hired by the employer then the value is higher charges in either case we reduce the amount paid or recovered from the employee and the balance is the taxable value movable asset may be transferred by the employer to the employee right and the movable asset is belonging to the employer and it is transferred and it not only covers the case of transfer to the employee but also any member of the household of the employee in that case what is the taxable value we pick up the actual cost to the employer actual cost to the employer and we make deduction on account of depreciation and amount paid or recovered from the employee that gives us the taxable value <coughs> as far as depreciation is concerned for how many years do we provide depreciation we provide depreciation for each completed year for which the asset was put to use by whom by the employer <coughs> and what is the rate and the method of depreciation it depends on what kind of what kind of asset is it for computers and electronic items the highest rate of 50% applies and the depreciation is provided on reducing balance method for a motor car there is a reduced rate of 20% on the same reducing balance method but on any other asset it is the lowest rate of 10% but not on reducing balance on straight line method now as far as electronic items is concerned what is the scope it means it includes data storage and handling items like computer digital diary and printer so these are also considered as electronic items but it does not include household appliances for example washing machine microwave oven mixer hot plate oven etc so if there are household appliances they are not electronic items they are categorized under as any other asset the next area is office support there are certain special allowances helper allowances uh, which is granted to meet expenditure on helper but only for official duties not for personal duties that is uh, provided exemption secondly uniform allowance for expenditure on purchase or maintenance of uniform but only for official duties the exemption is provided and what is the extent to the extent expenses are actually incurred for the purpose for which allowance is granted this is the quantum of exemption the balance is taxable what about food and beverages food and beverages provided by the employer and there are certain situations as far as tea or snacks provided during working hours are concerned taxable value doesn't arise the perquisite is exempt as far as free food and non alcoholic beverages are concerned three situations arise one where these are provided during working hours where either at office or at the business premises or in the second situation where they are provided by way of paid vouchers which are non transferable which cannot be transferred to anyone else and which the employee can use at eating joints in both these cases the valuation is the same and what is the value expenditure incurred by the employer minus rupees 50 per meal and then we of course reduce the amount which is paid or recovered from the employee and that gives the value in another in the third situation of free food and non alcoholic beverages these are provided during working hours but in a remote area or an offshore installation in such case no taxable value arises and the perquisite is exempt from tax in any other case the value is the expenditure which is incurred by the employer of course reduced by the amount paid or recovered from the employee so what we need to note is alcoholic beverages is fully taxable it is not exempt also if the employee receives an allowance 
say lunch allowance, dinner allowance, or tiffin allowance that is fully taxable, no exemption is provided. In case of the telephone expenses, telephone expenses, they may be incurred by the employer on behalf of the employee. That is exempt. It is not taxable. And telephone includes mobile phone as well. But if the employee is in receipt of telephone allowance, it is fully taxable. It is fully taxable. We now move to financial incentives. Interest-free or concessional loan. So either the loan can be interest-free, that means 0% interest, or it can be at a concessional rate of interest. So either an interest-free or a concessional loan, and it can be for any purpose whatsoever. And it is made available to whom? To not only the employee, but to any member of his household. And it is made available by the employer. It can also be made available or by any person on behalf of such employer. So all this benefit is taxable. And what is the valuation? For this, first we need to check the amount of loan. The amount of loan. And if there are multiple loans during the year, then we need to see the aggregate amount. So if the amount or the aggregate amount is not more than 20,000, that means it is 20,000 or less than 20,000, right? That means the loans are petty in nature. Then nothing is taxable. The perquisite is exempt. If that is not the case, then we need to check whether the loan has been made available for medical treatment. But not in respect of all the diseases, in respect of prescribed diseases. In such case also, the valuation is not taxable, it is exempt. Right? If either this is not satisfied or this is not satisfied, then the perquisite becomes taxable and then we need to make the valuation. But where the loan is for medical treatment of prescribed diseases, we need to make a note that in such case, the employee may receive a claim under a medical insurance scheme from the insurance company. In that case, to that extent, to that extent, the perquisite is not exempt. To that extent, the loan is not exempt. What is the extent? To the extent to which uh, the claim has been received by the from the insurance company under a medical insurance scheme. The balance of the loan is exempt, but uh, to this particular extent, the loan is not exempt. And anyways, if the loan is not covered either by this or by this, it is not exempt. So in this case, we proceed to value the taxable perquisite. And what is the value? It is the interest benefit multiplied by the maximum outstanding monthly balance. So first we need to figure out the value of interest benefit. So we need to compare the actual interest rate charged and we need to benchmark that against what? Against the SBI interest rate prevailing us on 1st April of the previous year for the loan for the same purpose, right? So the actual interest rate and the SBI interest rate we need to compare and the difference is the interest benefit. Then we need to calculate the maximum outstanding monthly balance. And that is the aggregate outstanding balance for each loan as on the last day of each month. If it is a case of multiple loan, then we need to figure it out for each loan and then, and then we need to aggregate that. For a single loan, it becomes a single computation. So for each loan, what we need to do, we need to first figure out the outstanding balance of that loan for each month, but on the last day of the each month and then we aggregate all that up right and then the value becomes interest benefit into the aggregate right but since it is the aggregate for all the months we multiply it by 1 by 12 right so that brings us to the amount of value of perquisite as far as ESOP or employee stock option plan is concerned the taxable value is the fair market value of a specified security or sweat equity shares but FMB on what date on the date on which the option is exercised by the SSE. Option is exercised and we reduce the amount paid by or recovered from the SSE. There may be a gift or a voucher or a token which may be received by the employee. Not only the employee but also by any member of the household of the employee. On maybe on ceremonial occasions or otherwise. From whom? From the employer. In that case, the benefit is taxable as perquisite. And what is the valuation? If this is received in cash, then no exemption is provided, it is fully taxable. But if it is in kind, then there is a threshold of 5,000, right? So 
in multiple uh, cases we aggregate the value for the previous year and if that value is less than 5000 that means the value is small and therefore it is exempt it is not taxable otherwise it is fully taxable and there are two views in respect of the 5000 threshold as per view 1 the entire value is taxable if it is 5000 or more as per view 2 only the value in excess of 5000 is taxable mostly view 1 is followed but if you choose to follow view 2 it will be good if you give a note in your answer to this effect in case of a gift check you should remember that it is equivalent to a cash gift and therefore it is fully taxable and threshold of 5000 doesn't apply credit card expenses this is taxable and what is the value so expenses may be incurred by the employee and they may be charged to a credit card not only by the employee but also by any member of his household right and that is then paid or reimbursed by the employer so that becomes the taxable value we deduct the amount paid or recovered from the employee now expenses not only include the usual expenses but also the membership fees and the annual fees and the credit card not only includes the primary credit card but also the add-on card but if the expenses are claimed to have been wholly incurred for official purposes then the perquisite is exempt it is not taxable if the documentation conditions are fulfilled and these are similar to what we saw in the case of motor car club expenses it's also largely similar to credit card expenses valuation so expenditure may be incurred in a club by the employee not only by the employee but also by any member of his household and that is ultimately paid or reimbursed by the employer that is the taxable value and we reduce the amount paid or recovered from the employee uh, the expenditure the expenditure also includes annual fees or periodical fees in certain cases the employer takes corporate membership of the club in that case while valuation while doing the valuation of the perquisite we need to make sure that we do not include the initial fees which has been paid by the employer for acquiring the corporate membership in certain cases the employer may provide the facility of health clubs sports and similar facilities uniformly to all the employees in such case perquisite is not taxable it is exempt what if the employee claims that the expenses are wholly for official purposes then just like for credit card expenses perquisite is not taxable if documentation conditions are fulfilled now there is this concept of obligation of employee being met by employer if something is the obligation of employee but it is met by the employer then it is actually a benefit provided by the employer to the employee and therefore it is taxable as perquisite therefore it is taxable as perquisite for example if the employer pays income tax of the employee on his behalf which is actually the obligation of the employee then that becomes a taxable perquisite but there is a specific exemption provided under section 1010 cc in this respect but not for the entire tax what it says is that tax on the non-monetary perquisites non-monetary perquisites paid by the employer on behalf of the employee is exempt if it is any other case then it is not exempt it will be taxable so all the other allowances and perquisites which we have not discussed so far are fully taxable whatever exemptions are available we have discussed so far so finally we provide deductions under section 16 from the gross salary income so we aggregate the salary payments taxable perquisite taxable allowances and then we get gross salary income from which we allow deductions under section 16 and there are three of them first is the standard deduction section 16 ia which is lower off rupees 50,000 or the amount of salary second is deduction on account of entertainment allowance section 16 to y so it is an allowance which is first included in salary and thereafter from gross salary income a deduction is allowed if it is a case of a government employee then the deduction is allowed to the extent of lower of 20 percent of basic salary only the basic salary or the upper cap of 5,000 or the entertainment allowance which is received for a non-government employee no deduction is allowed lastly deduction on account of professional tax under section 16 3i if it is paid by the employee himself then from the gross salary income we allow deduction of such tax which is paid by the employee but where the employer pays such tax on behalf of the employee then first it becomes a perquisite then uh, because the employer is paying on behalf of the employee so it is first included in the salary as perquisite and thereafter from gross salary income deduction is allowed of tax paid so the deduction of professional tax is not on due basis it is on payment 
basis. Finally, we summarize the connotation of salary or meaning of salary for different purposes. So the salary means only the basic salary where we are talking about deduction for entertainment allowance. Salary means basic salary plus BNS allowance when we are talking of gratuity exemption for a POGA employee. Salary means basic salary plus BNS allowance but only when it is considered as part of salary for computing retirement benefits and commission based on fixed percentage of turnover. When we are talking about gratuity exemption for non-POGA employee, leave salary exemption, exemption for employees contribution to RPF, VRS exemption or HRA exemption. And salary when computing the value of residential accommodation, it includes BBA, CDM and excludes PPR. This is the mnemonic for the different inclusions and exclusions that we have discussed while discussing residential accommodation valuation. So this brings us to the end of income taxable under the head salaries.